Ah, oh, shucks. You're awesome, Lisa. Thank you. Alright, I'm going to be reading a couple of excerpts from a story I wrote called uh, Rituals of Gorgons. And my inspiration for these were um, Lana Del Rey's uh, Born to Die and Sylvia Plath's final poem that she wrote in her lifetime called Edge. Thank you. And, oh, what happened to, oh, Edge, Sylvia Plath. Thank you. Uh, these are not my words. I'm just going to read you the last few um, uh, lines of uh, Sylvia Plath's poem because they actually do have some bearing on this story. Um, the moon has nothing to be sad about, staring from her hood of bone. She's used to this sort of thing. Her blacks crackle and drag. <clears throat> All right, Grandma. Here we go. When the truck hits her, it's like a jump cut. No fade out, no stars, no waxing wave to bridge her ride now. She only had to blink her eyes once to make it happen. The impact bending of metal, and the shattering of triumphant bones. Now it's just her on the sidewalk. She sees a lot of feet not going anywhere. They're all keeping their distance, giving her space. She looks down at herself. Her body is curved the wrong way, a rag doll thrown in anger. The street noise is muffled as through a thick warm scarf. She's trying to look past the tarmac and see faces and eyes, but she can't move that part of her. The sunlight is an auburn fog. When the nausea hits, it crushes her sternum. Her reality kicks in, and she begins the pilgrimage. She is an accident. She knew that from the very beginning. Of course, she can't remember what she was before that. Or is she willingly blind to avoid some of the truth hiding from her there? It's really cold. And some bloke with a thick upturned collar brightens as he recognizes. He brightens as he recognizes her face from the news and steps closer. He pulls out his phone, and he begins filming her. And she floats out of herself, and she watches everything unravel from above. The shower is her most vulnerable place. It's worse than the mirror because she's there with her body, her flesh hostage to her folds and the scales. She's incomplete. Here's the incomplete ritual made real. The hot water feels good against her back and makes her want to stay despite her dysphoric relationship with her nakedness. This is better than looking in the mirror. It's more intimate. The mirror vexes her, and she cannot avoid staring into her own accusing eyes. She's dealt with this for so long, and she thinks that she should be used to it ne by now, but she isn't, and she never will be. The memory of X asking her to tea comes back to her in a crushing wave, and the natural process by which this occurred, another girl accepting and liking her for who she is and not what she can give them, temporarily relieves her self-loathing. Self X made her feel like a person instead of a product. She'd gladly have traded her celebrity for obscurity. Each, gl each, each glimpse of X's face cuts her heart. The mass of her wavy black mane reflected against the tabletop where they put the saucers at their far corners. She never fully appreciated the beauty of Mediterranean women until X flailed into her life. X's olive skin brings her brown eyes in full brightness before her and the dark floral pattern of her dress dances from neckline to hem. It is very much like her own dress, except she cannot help but stare. She thinks X can, can do this all so much better. She wonders if this girl is the key to helping her find a sense of balance in her own life. She snaps out of it as the girl from the counter brings their tea, Bring, gives them both a weird look. She's more worried about being recognized as who she is than of being clocked. X doesn't seem to notice or care about the tea server's distaste towards them. She likes X's confidence. It's growing on her. X can be someone good, she thinks. She hasn't been lucky at all, and she's not wanted to go out or do anything other than shopping or work, and even then, only behind layers of, like, thick scarves. The paparazzi have been aggravated. And just when she thinks they've gotten tired of hounding her, they pop out from behind another corner and speed off before she even has a chance to tell them to go fuck themselves. 
She doesn't like to shout at them anymore because she's still self-conscious about her voice. Heads turn. She hates it still. She wants to get back at them somehow, to freeze them in their tracks. She's still absorbing X's voice. A full-depth resonance. Baritone, yes, but as a saxophone might sound in a soft 1980s ballad. There is also a breathiness in X's voice, and this magnetizes her along with X's dark eyes. Usually she tends to look away, but she wants to maintain eye contact with X during this tea, because X is being kind to her. X asks her if it's okay if she moves her chair a little closer to the middle of the table. The glare of the sunlight is getting on her nerves. She instinctively moves her own chair to stay at a polite distance from X, but she changes her mind. She likes the, ex the idea of X sitting closer to her. She blows at her cup and sips at the edge. English breakfast with orange and skin. She always finds good energy from the taste, or at least it distracts her from feeling so much doubt. This is the awkward early phase of transition for her, and she wants to find. She wants to. She wants to ask X discreetly as possible when or if things will ever get better. X carries herself so well, and she wants to know how she got to that place, or if, even if she will even be welcomed. Instead, she asks X what she got not into her towards her cup. The steam f floats into the sunlight, and it looks pretty. X says she got a jasmine green tea hybrid. Sometimes it's best to experiment with tea, especially in Britain. You can usually pick something at random and usually end up with something decent. She tells X the truth that she's usually been afraid to try new things, especially since the huge blow up in the media over the holidays. She hadn't wanted anything to be public, she just wanted to take care of herself and go back to work. Start coding again. X tells her she obviously isn't afraid to try completely new things. If something sucks in her life, X, X tells her, you can change it, and she knows that well enough. X edges her own cup towards her and invites her to have a taste. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fucking tragedy queen. <laughs> I'm the, the lesser of the half, and Lisa's, uh, I'm the managing editor of the class, and Lisa's <laughs> fiance, he's been, come, been a little Woo! sick. Um, I believe the next reader is, everybody knows her already, so I'm just going to have her come up. Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Girls in the Garden of Holy Suffering. I was born a thousand years into the sadness of my reincarnation. My understanding of darkness comes early. I have no words for it, no context with which to drown in or master it. But I know it's there. It is my pretty secret wound. I hide it and pick at it. I'm preoccupied by it. I am raised by the darkness, even when things are good, even when I do the normal things children do. I always want more of it. It is buried beneath my bed in the wall. It is my bath. I want that which makes me feel immortal, life a bit destructive. These feelings pulse through my formative years, but I have no articulation for it. I have an intimate relationship with dark hunger, that she is my invisible friend. My body and mind cannot catch up quick enough to the condition. My grandmother, from Sicily, is a tiny woman with jet black hair. She thinks the devil exists in my father, that he was born of the dark. She says he is the bad one, always will be. Dark and tall and tan, and his blood is thick and heavy. Not like lemons, but something else. He wakes early for work. I can smell the trail he leaves behind. Aftershave of birch, cotton shirts, masculinity, and he plays guitar. He can even, you can even hear him when he's not playing. Of course, darkness always makes everything audible. You can always tap into anything you want. It's a gift from hell that says, you're always sad, you've earned this. And then he leaves, and so does my mother. I make and remake them both again in other images throughout my life. They become everything, ghosts, 
nothing, a table, a spoonful of agave, a ritual, a want. 14 years old. I cast a spell for a boy, but he has to have all the parts. He needs to have long, pale hair. He has to be on fire inside. I don't have time for anything else, and I want him to be all mine. So mine, his organs fail without me. My word is my magic. I want to fuck him, but I want him to make love to me. The stupidity of youth fills me, but I don't mind. I don't mind choking on cliché. I want to hold all my want and sorrow in a person who can actually consume it. Boys make reality more beautiful. Here he comes, and he is perfect, and for the next five years I will drown in him. He is named after an angel, obviously. I lie about my age, but it all comes out in the water. Never mind. His mother loves me, takes me to museums and galleries and the theater. I am a good girl in their eyes, like a daughter, but he and I have our secrets. We play in the dark. We tend a dark garden. His hair makes ringlets at the end. It sticks to his neck when it rains, when he plays guitar, and he is taller than me by a foot or more. Through him, I understand that the body is an object, a thing to be abused and hardened and also loved. I don't forget about love. I don't claim a body is a weak thing all the time. Sometimes I victimize myself because I like it that way. He wants a special kind of sex, a kind I have to pretend to give. He wants to beat me up. He wants me to beat him up, fuck him up bad, and cover him with black spots. I don't want that. I have no desire to be the one doling out the pain. It's not that I'm innocent. It's that I'm bored by boys who ask things of me. I want to do the asking. The black stone inside my chest says I can. He has a friend, and his friend had the sort of things I learned to want. His friend is darkness, and he puts me over his lap. I want that, to be made into a thing, to be possessed by what I have no capacity for. I want to be a table, maybe a chair, maybe a vase. I am rocked in his hands, that black kelp hair, oh, his wicked mouth, and we sneak and sneak, we hold hands behind the angel's back, we fuck in stairwells. In a manner of speaking, he is not very kind, but I am above the idea of what is or is not good. That is a naivety I feel particularly disgusted by. He leads me to his father's bedroom and splays me. I understand that what I have been given is an explicit want with no end. 17 years old. I am in a foster home. I am so sad my limbs go numb. This place is sterile and safe and predictable. There are flowers on tables, doilies, de ga. But I am just a boarder. I have a bedtime. I stay up lingering. I perpetually dream of otherness, of flowers and fields only I know of, of boys and girls who know my pain and can say they suffer too. A quiet spell has been cast. I welcome the wound. I know I can relieve myself of want and negative space by chasing the dark, by finding those who understand it too. Then I find Sylvia. She is an antidote to my sour life. She fills in the lines. Tulips. I'll never forget it. I find a space in the school library, back behind the rows and rows of books near a wide open window. Summer is full and violent, and the other teenagers are kissing or smoking or fumbling in their disgrace. I watch them with a blinding hate and disgust. I want anything, anything but for them to come near me. I cannot. I will not let them know me or see me or sense me. All I want is my loneliness and my dreaming and my want to be realized. I want to get out of this other person's life. I want to be distracted by other bodies, then come home at night and keep it all to myself. I want to bring God down to my chest and be inhabited. My magic is my want. It rituals. These foul teenagers have no space for the vastness of my life, I think. They toil in the parking lots with their emptiness. I sneak off to New York City and listen to the opera and fuck boys. I dig holes in the soil and plant words that come true. But I always come back by sundown on Sundays because my foster mother says so. But I have Sylvia. I have a blackness in my heart like my father does. And I am filling it with the world and beauty and sneaky things. Through art, I elevate my heartache. I can live inside the trope. 
I can live inside my world. I build a world. Sylvia says, and I'll end it here, I don't want any flowers. I only wanted to lie with my hands turned up and be utterly empty. How free it is. You have no idea how free. The peaceness is so big it dazes you and it asks nothing. A name tag, a few trinkets, it is what the dead close on, finally. I imagine them shutting their mouths on it, like a communion tablet. I read it like a birthing, she understands in her sickness and melancholy and her being left in a London flat with two small children and her constant need for death and her actually achieving it, I think. How can she fit an unreasonable amount of suffering into such a small space? I cut the poem from the book and keep it in my pocket. It's the lock and it's the key. Thank you, guys. Yeah. How can anybody fell off to that? Oh my god. Fuck. I didn't finish it. I just got You always do that. You always do that. You're just like, okay, everybody's dead after me. No. Because you're awesome. It's a compliment. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so we have two more. We have Kara Jujulama and Lorraine Shrine. Uh, Kara Jujulama wrote. Sphinx Tears, which was a really trippy. Yeah, get go and grab wine. Anybody who wants, go go. And, I encourage it. Go and grab beverages. Um, this was a really trippy story. There weren't that many like sci-fi weird stories in the Santo. Um, this was one of them. It's about a drug that, that can help you kind of travel in time. And it became a weird literary story with sci-fi elements. And I just, I just love it. Um, <laughs> As I was looking for a part of this to read, I was like, none of this makes sense at all. So um, I remixed it a little bit, uh, and this will get you maybe part of the story. We'll see. This is Fixed Tears. Fireworks scattered, expanding galaxies of stars into the sky, clutched hands spinning, turning, barefoot in the dry California grass. A red dress blurring into a white dress, the taste of lip gloss and sucrose sweet Smirnoff ice. That night, it felt like the summer would last forever. Harlow didn't remember if the memory was real or Sphinx tears anymore. At least she wished she didn't. I don't really do hallucinogens, Allie said, standing awkwardly on one foot, her stained hands stuffed in the pockets of her jeans. Up on the rooftop of the resort hotel, where a very important conference of very important people was taking place, 13-year-old Madison Harris shook the packet in Allie's face, her purple hair brushing against her eyes. It's not a hallucinogen. It shows you the future. It shows you a future, Calvin clarified. A good one. It shows you being happy. Harlow had learned to read the softness in Allie's face, the quirks of her lips, the liquid movement of her eyes. An only child, Allie had never learned to hide her feelings, not like the Harris kids had. I don't know, Harlow said. You've never been happy. It might not work for you. That's so mean, Harlow, Madison protested. Of course it will work. Come on. She shook a tiny bit from the packet into everyone's hand. There was barely a crystal for each, only a few moments, but it was enough. It had always been enough so far. Harlow remembered the taste she'd had before, flashbulbs going off as she strolled along a runway, wind in her hair as she drove a convertible down a cliffside highway, a glass of champagne and the glint of a proffered diamond. Nothing certain, nothing concrete, but Calvin said it changed as you got older. The visions grew closer in time, more detailed, more real, until maybe, maybe you could figure out how to make them part of your life. Harlow could do that. She was going to be happy. She was going to get what she wanted. Allie, nervousness written across her face, settled in next to Harlow, the roughness of jeans pressing against Harlow's thigh, where it showed bare below the hem of her sundress. Crystals cupped in her palm. Allie lifted her hand and offered a bump against Harlow's. Cheers. Bottoms up. 
The taste of sphinx shot off in fractals along Harlow's tongue, startling her nervous system into hyperdrive. The back of her head whooshed like a waterbed, and Harlow shut her eyes, the network of bursts, like the flaming jewels in Indra's web spreading from her tongue to the blackness behind her eyes. White. White sheets crumpling, sunlight caught in them. Harlow blinked, her eyes open to meet brown ones, soft and familiar, a warm weight over her hips, and then a smile, murmured words and soft kisses up her throat and jaw before finding her mouth. A weight landed on the bed beside them, fur, the yowl of a hungry cat. Harlow flailing out to push him off, laughter vibrating against her neck. Your turn. Your cat. Why is he only mine in the mornings? The gooshing came again, and Harlow scrambled for balance, scraping her knuckles on the shingle with a flat rooftop. Her brother and sister and Allie were coming back, Calvin jerking his hat into his lap to cover his heart on, Madison grinning like a thief, and Allie, Allie's eyes were wide, and she was staring at Harlow like she'd seen a ghost. God, I can't wait to do that again, Madison moaned, leaning back against the planter. It's so good. I'm totally going to be a model. She grinned at Calvin. You could just got laid, didn't you? Harlow, Allie, spill. Shut up, Harlow said, getting to her feet, hating how her knees wobbled. Private. Allie? Allie's smile was weak. I'm really not that into hallucinogens. Bruises were forming around Harlow's mouth as she sat up on the roof, still stinking of axe and chlorine and boy sweat. Allie held ice against Harlow's cheek and worried her lower lip between her teeth. You could tell someone about this. Harlow shook her head, wincing as the bruise jarred against the dripping bar towel full of ice. Who'd believe me? Maybe my mom? Snort. They're friends. Harlow looked out toward the slowly setting sun. The rolling golden hills seemed to stretch forever, but the small dimple where the highway lay broke through them, disappearing off to somewhere, somewhere else. I'm fine, Harlow said. I did what I had to do. Allie's lips tightened, her gaze flicking away. Which was worse for her, Harlow wondered, watching get smacked or watching her make out with the pool boy. She'd do either again, to not see, to not ever see another bad flash of Calvin lying dead in a heap. She'd do whatever she could to look after Madison, too. A crunch and a clink. Allie's hand, even colder than usual from the ice, pressed something into hers. Keys from Allie's mom's rental car. We said San Francisco. Allie ducked her head, a curtain of hair falling over her eyes. She swallowed before she continued. Take Highway 1 all the way to the port of L.A., find a ship, see the world. The key slid into the lap of her flowered sundress, and Harlow found her fingers curling inside the fall of Allie's flannel, gripping onto the clinging tank top underneath. Her other hand cupped Allie's cheek and drew her near to kiss her, just once, pressing hard enough that the bruise on her mouth ached. Allie's lips parted under her touch. Her sigh tasted of sadness in the heady glitter of Sphinx tears. Then Harlow let her go. I can't. The resort's pool boy had biceps so big that Harlow couldn't even reach her fingers around to squeeze them. He smelled like sweat and axe, and he shaved his chest, smooth and tan and glossy under his v-neck. He teased her and gave her his number, and then smiled at Calvin over her head. Sphinx tears were only supposed to give you hallucinations of the good futures, but everything has side effects, and Harlow saw, saw Calvin on one of the hotel beds, helping the pool boy shock his pants, and saw her father yelling, empty rooms and dead eyes, dead, dead, dead. When she got caught kissing the pool boy and her father smacked her across the face and called her a whore, she stopped seeing the flashes. She swallowed the blood welling in her mouth and smiled. Paper cups and a stolen bottle of wine, feet dangling over the edge of the rooftop, the sparkle of sphinx against the darkness of closed eyes, wind whipping hastily tied scarves as the convertible raced down the cliffside highway. Maybe this time they'd spin out and plunge down the cliff face into the ocean. Maybe this time Dad would hit her for real and she'd smash her head into the table. Maybe this time she'd be brave enough to take the turn off that that Sphinx had seen, the one route to that world where they all could have been happy. Maybe next time. All right, and all you itchy people are trying to get done with this. Um, all right, so we have one more person, Lorraine Shine. <laughs> um, she actually wrote like the story that I was looking for, not to say that everything else wasn't awesome, but when I read Sammy Plot's poems in Ariel, I was like, can somebody like write a trippy? like, landscape adventure thing with these. And she did it. She did, like, a carnival thing where, like, it's called SP Land. Sylvia Plath 
land. Like, I want to go there. I want to go to Sylvia Plaza. And, like, I want to ride those <laughs> horrible rides. Horrible, depressing rides. I want to ride those horrible rides. And she <laughs> wrote that story. And it's my dream come true. I'm, I'm so happy she came out. So, here we go. SP Land. Actually, it's SP World. Um, SP but, World. Right. Yes. Um, yes. So, Ariel was my favorite book, too. And this, this also was inspired by reading about Sylvia Plath's uh, no, well, um, actually, Ted uses other woman, which mm. people really haven't um, known about enough, I think. So, SP World. Under a blank, emptied sky that had stopped filling with snow, the red lights of the giant Ferris wheel glowed like blood and long icicles hung like frozen tears from its swaying cars. The fair was only open in winter. How did she know that? It's cold up here, A thought. Looking down from her car at the wheel's top, she saw people swarming like bees in a hive, going from one hopeless ride to another. But why was she here? That man down there, the roller coaster operator, looked familiar. He's a handsome man with big hands, she thought. I miss his hands. He wouldn't leave her for me. I am not blonde or English. He wouldn't replace her with me. And who was she? A had slept in her bed and lived in her house, and all she remembered was how she wouldn't let A be with him. The wind blew. A's brown hair into her face. A child. And where was her child? She did remember when she first got here. Welcome to SP World, dear, the official park greeter had said. A wondered what the initials stood for. What brings you here, dear? Pills, gas, drug driving, poetry, perhaps? <laughs> the park greeter said with a practiced smile. She wore a gray uniform with the SP World logo, a yellow hive embroidered on the pocket. Have you read the requirements for an admission ticket? The woman pointed to the sign over the entrance to the grounds. Entrance requirement. At least two attempts and a note from a doctor <laughs> saying you should be under careful observation. I'm not sure I qualify, A said. I don't even know how I got here. No matter, sweetie, if you're here, it must be for a reason. Go enjoy yourself. She gave A a ticket, then pushed her toward the ticket booth, where a clerk in a cap and a brown shirt like a Nazi uniform punched a B-shaped hole in a ticket and handed it to her. On one side of the fair was a row of stalls. A large wooden arrow pointed to them. It said, the ten-in-one sideshow. It looked less crowded, so A started there. The first freak show stall had a banner proclaiming, See the disquieting muses just arrived from their European tour. Here were two dressmakers dummies standing in front of a painted backdrop that showed a red fortress in the distance. A statue of Apollo stood nearby. The tall one wore a white toga. Its head was marked with black stitch marks like scars. A seated dummy next to it had a tiny black pinhead on a huge stuffed body. Both were eyeless, seemed. Blank faces, bobbin heads. We are eyeless, head stitched up, but we see you, they said to her in flat sing-song voices. And we see her playing with the cards. Then the muses sneered at her. Thirteen poems in your last three months. Won't you do it, do it, do it? You must be confusing me with someone else, A said, and walked to the next stall. The marquee read Electroshock Show in flashing lights. This was an exhibit of people getting shock, shock treatment. The viewers were invited to apply the shocks themselves by the barker. Step right up and turn the handle. You'll only be helping them, not causing them pain. 
There was a pretty blonde woman on the table, strapped down. A pulled the lever and watched the blue lightning convulse the woman on the table, arching her back. Was she better? The blonde was not moving now and looked very pale. Was she alive? A ran from her, panicked. Ahead was a stand of bobbing colored balloons. A man with a handlebar mustache handed her one for a dollar. He also gave her a long, sharp pin, telling her, If you pop the balloon, you win a prize. She popped it. What is my prize? The man laughed. This, he said, and handed her the limp shred of red balloon. She put it in her pocket. <laughs> Maybe the rise up ahead would make more sense. She pushed her way through the crowd to the midway, toward the first ride, a lurching tilter wheel the moon and the yew tree. A giant tree stood before her, towering almost as high as the ferris wheel. Cars shaped like crescent moons swung out from its branches as it rotated, raising screaming children into the air. A worried they would fall out, felt tears well up in her eyes. She decided to save her ticket for something else. She walked down the path to a sign that said games of chance. Spin the wheel of chance, said the carnival barker. She stopped before it. It was red and black and divided into different sections. One read, Nurse comes home early. Next to it was, Neighbor smells gas. Another read, Wind stuffed animal. The barker, I guess that's kind of a discrepancy. But the barker <laughs> spun it. It whirled and whirled in a blur, but never stopped on anything. The pointer never settled. It is so odd, A thought, and decided not to play. She walked away as the barker called after her, taunting, What are you so afraid of? shaking his fist. Bump a car. This was an electrified platform on which small, realistic-looking automobiles whizzed, careening wildly. It was surrounded by a deep lake. The goal was to not let your car be bumped off the platform into the lake. As they watched, she saw that some of the drivers thought the goal was to drive your car directly into the lake because there were wrecked, half-submerged autos in the water with people clinging to their sides. They never called out for help, and there was no one on the shore to pull them out. The zoo. This way to the wild creatures exhibit, the arrow ahead pointed. Several iron cages with tall bars stood in a row. The first one had a crudely lettered note on it. Please don't feed the tulips. A bouquet of vicious tulips snapped their red jaws at her, rattling and lunging their long stems between the bars as she gazed at them. Even though they looked safely caged, she stepped back. She felt their petals enveloping her throat, throttling her. A gasped and hurried on. The next cage was no better, a cluster of growling, vivid poppies, whose black tooth-like pistols gnashed together, leaning forward to slurp at her. She ran around the corner to the next exhibit. As she got closer, she heard a loud buzzing and saw the sign, Hall of Bees. <laughs> a giant beehive with no fence or netting around it to protect viewers swarmed before her. Something sticky and molten fell from the canopy above her, dripping down onto her face and her sleeve. It was honey. She tried to wipe it off, but it was too late. The bees buzzed toward her in an angry swarm. She backed away, swirling at them in terror, but it was no use. Then a beekeeper in a white suit, high gloves, and a shrouded helmet with a netted, netted mask drew them away from her, saying, Beware the queen. They followed behind him, a humming, wavery, wavering procession. The Fun House Mirrors. A entered the Hall of Mirrors in the Fun House. They were all different sizes and shapes. The first one was long, and she saw herself elongated, stretched thin as taffy. In the next, around mirrors, she saw herself squat and stunted. Who would love her if she really looked like that? She wouldn't look English enough. The diamond-shaped mirror that was next made her look much younger, first showing her as a child in Tel Aviv, playing on the beach, then as a teenager dancing with the handsome British soldiers. She walked to the last mirror and saw herself aged, her hair grown gray. 
Then the image vanished, and the mirror's center filled with a silver-scaled fish, expanding till it was no longer a fish but the surface of a great lake. But strangely, A didn't drown. She was now on the shore of the lake. There were paddle boats on it, and she saw a tall man in one with a blonde woman. They looked familiar. Though both were paddling, the blonde woman was sinking lower in the boat, but he was not. He kept paddling, not even turning his head. Horrified by this, A shouted for a lifeguard, but there was none. She needed to get away from here. She needed an explanation. She followed a sign to the fortune-telling tent. She entered a canvas tent on the edge of the fairgrounds. A sat in the folding chair next to a table. The table held a flickering candle, an incense cone, and a small amethyst crystal ball. A hissing sound came from the tent's shadowed corners. The reader was a tall gypsy woman with a British accent and big hands. She wore a spangled velvet scarf and a long tiered skirt. And what is your name, dear? A couldn't remember. Was it Sylvia? Sylvia, I think, she said. Yes, it must be, because she remembered sleeping in her bed. Funny, you don't look like one. But cut the cards, dear, the woman said, handing her the deck and leaning back. A shuffled the cards, then split them into piles. They felt sharp as she did so, and when she was done, she had tiny red slits from paper cuts on her thumbs. Here's your fortune, said the woman, laying down the cards. She turned them over and fell silent. Thick stars govern your life, she said. These cards represent your past. I see you made a journey here from another land, perhaps to escape evil. Yes, I'm originally from Germany, A said. Then I emigrated to Palestine to escape the war. The tarot reader turned over the cards. The Eight of Swords, the Devil. I see you are involved with a poet. No, wait. She turned over two more cards. Three poets. Well, my husband is one. It was amazing how accurate this reader was. The cards on the table were the King of Cups, reverse, the Queen of Cups. Or did the card say the Cuck Queen? Now for your future cards, said the woman. I see a couple entering your life. I see a woman. The tower struck by lightning with bodies falling from it. She recognized that one, the Queen of Swords. But the fortune teller now turned over many more cards, one she had never seen before. The Queen of Ovens, the Two of Orphans, the Priestess of Pills, the Tower of Electroshocks, the Wheel of Misfortune, the King of Infidelity, the Six of Slash Wrists, the Cups of Pills, the Page of Poetry, the Hierophant Psychiatrist, the Nine of Overdoses, the Hanged Other Woman, Bad Judgment, the Ten of Bees, the Lunatic Hospital. And I'll stop there. <laughs> All right. So this has been a riveting evening. Um, we need to get out of here, like, quick. But I would love to have, like, some kind of quick Q&A, maybe five minutes. Um because I think these stories are very intriguing, and I would love for the readers to be able to ask a few questions. So if the readers could just come up forward, and uh, if the audience has questions, if the audience has questions, I'll have questions, but ask questions. Yeah, five minutes. Oh, I don't Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Oh,
Yeah, I know. Alright, I have a question for Ben and Vito. What, why are you so fucked up? <laughs> oh, for Larissa? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's a, well, it's a weird combination of being like a very polite Canadian and <laughs> finding an outlet and also, I don't know, like I've been, like I've, we talked about this on your podcast, just that a lot of uh, weird and fortunate things have happened physically, uh, either like illness related stuff and that's why I'm very kind of Tell people a little bit about, about that. Yeah. Like, they don't know about that. Okay, yeah. So when I was, uh, <laughs> so when I was 14, 15, I started uh, experiencing audio and visual hallucinations. So for a while, people were thinking, you know, this guy either has, you know, epilepsy or uh, he's schizophrenic or something. And then, so I was carded from different psychologists and psychiatrists, and they all said, no, it's definitely something else wrong. So eventually, they found it was a physiological thing, and then they ended up diagnosing me with lupus, and that was just one thing I have it in my brain. So, like, when it flares up, it basically puts pressure on different regions, and that's how the, the hallucinations come about. So through that, I, 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 I because of the meds I was on.